moving on to our next speaker now, Keith Sharp. I'm delighted, um, I feel privileged to be able to introduce Keith to you. Keith is Director of the University of London International Programmes at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Keith has researched actively and been published heavily in areas such as evolutionary psychology and social theory. And more importantly, and I think of great interest today, will be his research into the social implications of transformation in communication technology and the international higher education policy and practice. Paul gave us a challenge this morning, which was about um, ensuring that we could get higher education to the critical masses. And as responsible um, managers and academics within higher education, this is a challenge for us all. So it's particularly appropriate that Keith should be with us today because the University of London International Pro, um, Av University have, of course, been doing this for many years and are going to show us um, possibly how, how they've achieved that. So it's very appropriate that Keith is here today to talk about the ecology of transnational higher education in the 21st century. Please put your hands together for Keith. The idea of ecology, which is a notion that I'd come across in, as it were, a previous life, being interested in evolutionary theory and social science and thinking about how... Um, environments interact with organisms and this sort of thing. And I started then to wonder how would that analogy work uh, when one thinks about it in terms of what's going on in the world around us and what's been going on over the last 15 or 20 years um, in terms of the uh, development of this concept of transnational education, which in one way or another, I think most of us in this room are in some way uh, involved in. Um, so traditionally, start with some definitions. I won't even read that. Um, it's obviously authoritative because it comes from the Council of Europe. Um, basic idea of transnational education that the uh, learning uh, takes place in a country uh, other than where the your home university is based. There's probably a hundred different definitions of that. Um, but this has been a, uh, what's a uh, Julie was kind enough to mention the University of London, which of course has been doing this since 1858, but this is something which um, increasingly universities around the world are engaged in, and it's not just the traditional flow of uh, education from the UK um, to, to, to the Far East, from the US to the Far East, from Australia. Um, it's happening in both directions now. We're seeing uh, increasing forms of transnational education. Overseas branch campuses, for example, opening up in cities like London and New York. Um, so this is obviously something which has been prominent over the last 15 or 20 years. Then we get to the definition of ecology. Um, quite an old one there, but that seemed to be about the shortest and most succinct I could find. The science of the interrelationships of organisms and their environment, both animate and inanimate. Okay, well, they're the two definitions, so what do they have to do with each other? So the next job is to try to put them together, and I felt, well, by analogy, albeit rather a stretched one, uh, one might define the ecology of transnational higher education as the interrelationships between higher education institutions and their global social, legal and regulatory, political and economic contexts, which is pretty much everything. I think when thinking about the idea of ecology, it's actually quite useful as the higher education world has globalized and continues to do so in increasing and complex ways. And one of the reasons is that um, it, the notion of ecology emphasizes the way in which environments, um, uh, the way in which uh, environments impact upon the way institutions operate, and these are. Uh, this has always been the case for local environments, but increasingly this is true of global environments as well. And it also recognizes the complexity and interconnectedness of those environments. They're not simple, they're not obvious, they're not straightforward. We don't see simple correlations between economic, for example, uh, economic downturns and the behavior of higher education institutions. Then all of a sudden some regulatory change happens which turns everything on its head and everything goes off in a different direction. I think the, the notion of ecosystem is useful here, that change in one part of the system can provoke unexpected changes in another. And that can be global. A change in policy, a university can spend f uh, five years developing the uh, plans for a branch campus in some far-flung territory. 
and a momentary change of government, and I say that um, particularly as this is possibly about to happen here in Malaysia, a momentary change, a single change of government could completely scupper those plans and change the whole policy and render the whole thing impossible. And I've got some more examples of that later. So thinking about ecology as the analogy then, what are the major things that have been happening over the last 15 years or so in transnational higher education? I think there are many of these, but probably the, the major ones are, um, we've seen the rise and growth of the franchise, which following this common idea, the McDonaldization of higher education, that's a bit unkind. I mean, there's nothing wrong with McDonald's, at least uh, as my friends who eat McDonald's all the time tell me, you, get, you know what you're getting, you get the same thing everywhere. And that might not always be true of franchised higher education, but the idea is um, a common product which is then delivered in different contexts around the world. Um, but it's a standardized model. There isn't much room for uh, variation. It's a particularly, if you like, modern notion that what works in one place will work in another place. Um, and that really was the model that I think was probably dominant at the start of the 21st century. Um, we've seen also the rise, and I would say suggest fall, of the validation model. Um, the idea that a university in one place um, validates the provision of another and awards degrees on the basis of um, activity which it itself is not actively engaged in. Of course, we've seen the rise of the branch campus. Um, and as I'll say in a minute, we've seen also a much greater rise of franchises that pretend to be branch campuses. And we can find uh, plenty of examples here of where local policies have driven franchise operations to represent themselves much more as branch campuses. And this has been happening in the UK. Obviously, distance and online education, which we've uh, already heard about this morning, but has adopted a whole variety of new forms, largely driven by technology. And finally, the MOOCs, which Donald just been talking about. Um, 2012 is often called the year of the MOOC. I don't know whether this appears, will eventually appear in the Chinese calendar, but um, it is, um, uh, was a year in which everybody was talking about MOOCs. In my own institution, in the University of London, we've had a flirtation with Coursera. Um, and uh, this is uh, a thought by certain people in the university to be going to revolutionize what the University of London has been doing. We're going to go from 50,000 to 200,000 students um, in a couple of years because of MOOCs. This is the thinking. I, as you'll see in a minute, I don't actually agree with that, but this has been the hype that we've all been dealing with for the last year or so. So let's start with franchises, the idea of awarding institutions uh, programs being offered by overseas institutions. Um, sometimes they have degree awarding powers, sometimes they don't. One of the issues which I think has emerged um, with this, and this is a kind of ecological issue, is the role of faculty within the domestic university, the so-called flying faculty models. And many uh, institutions tried to set up arrangements where uh, uh, somewhere between a franchise and a branch campus where faculty from the home university would regularly visit um, and would um, teach courses elsewhere. And this goes on all the time. This is happening uh, in, a, in a very wide scale. One of the problems, of course, with it is the sustainability of that model. Um, I myself was once responsible for a master's program that was being delivered by this model in Sharjah in the Middle East. And when we first delivered the program, uh, everybody was lining up, everyone in the department was lining up, so oh, can I go and teach it, can I go and teach it, this sounds really exciting. Most of them didn't really know where Sharjah was, or if they'd seen it on a map, they probably didn't know exactly what it was like there. They thought it was a kind of resort and near Dubai and lots of shopping malls and all this sort of thing. So anyway, they were all lining up to do it, and they all went off and did it, and they came back and had a reasonably good time. They went a second time. Third time, they were a little less certain. Fourth time, absolutely adamantly, they wouldn't go until we paid them lots of extra money. And by about the fifth or sixth time, we were having to hire in, effectively, part-time hourly paid faculty to go and do this. And increasingly, these were local faculty who we thought, well, they're they're there anyway, they might as well do it. So, so the notion of, in that case, the flying faculty became very, very difficult to sustain. And I do wonder how sustainable that is when entire models are built up based on that uh, notion. Localization of assessment has become a major concern by employers and by regulators um, for um, really concerns about academic standards and uh, the differences in standards which can occur when uh, assessment is localized. 
Um, there are also concerns, and these have become voiced in, in more and more uh, prominently, particularly in the UK, about equivalence of student learning experience. You can do the same course, but as the notion of the learning experience becomes much more um, broadly conceptualized, increasingly by regulators like the QAA as well, how do we talk about equivalence um, in terms of learning experience if you're studying in a small college in a remote part of the world um, uh, and not in the home university back in Australia or the US or the UK? Um, also, there have been concerns, this is more of a local thing, about high levels of accreditation of prior learning. Um, you know, minimum numbers of, say, 60 credits in the UK system um, required from the awarding university before the degree of that university can be awarded. And questions being asked about, does this really make it a degree of that university? Validation. Um, we've already defined what that is. Again, major concerns over academic standards here. Um, the idea being that uh, with a validation of a course, there is almost by definition no domestic equivalent. This is typically um, a course which the awarding university doesn't themselves offer, often in niche areas, not necessarily niche areas, but that, that was how it all started. Um, and again, major concerns have emerged over standards and uh, the equivalence of student learning experience. And of course, there have been scandals around this. Well, probably the most publicized and probably somewhat unfairly was the, um, the collapse, as it said, of the University of Wales validation model. Very major concerns about um, the degree to which um, academic standards can actually be controlled by the awarding body. And if they can't, what is the meaning of that degree? Um, and uh, what is the value of that degree to people who are taking it? And I think what we've seen is really quite a, a shock to the system as this sort of model has become uh, challenged. Of course, there are other models of validation, what I call the old CNAA model, which was the UK version of this, which is offered, for example, by the Open University Validation Service. But this is almost the delegation of degree awarding powers to the partner college, which is a very different model to the traditional validation model. Branch campuses. In a way, this has been the decade of the branch campus. Um, the OBH told us that uh, at the end of 2011, there were 200 branch campuses in operation around the world. That's international branch campuses, not those which exist within countries as well, with a, 30, a further 37 on the brink of coming into existence. There is, of course, however, a continuum between a fully owned, staffed, and uh, managed campus to really what I call franchises in disguise. And another example of the ecological model here is that uh, a number of UK universities have over the last couple of years set up branch campuses in London. And some of them aren't that very far from London, but they've set up branch campuses in London. And essentially what these are, are former um, franchises to private higher education colleges in London. But about three years ago, the rules changed governing private higher education in the UK, which meant that students coming to study in private colleges would no longer had a right to work. So this one change in the legislation meant that almost a thousand private colleges in London simply closed over a six month period. I mean, many of these were not real colleges at all. They were two rooms above a kebab shop in the Bow Road or something like that. But they were operating as colleges. They were bringing students from overseas. Um, and one of the responses to this have been for some UK universities to enter into a partnership with a former private college, call it a branch campus. The university sponsors the student, and the student acquires work rights. And so we have seen a small change in the law lead to a completely di different landscape about the way in which UK universities behave in their own territory. Um, we also have become aware of increasingly economic limitations on the development of genuine branch campuses, what I call genuine branch campuses, which are staffed and managed in the same way as the uh, domestic campus. It's become increasingly clear that because of the differentials in fees that could be charged in different territories, it's not possible in many territories to develop a genuine branch campus model because one is inevitably reliant upon local, um, local teaching staff because the levels of fees that can be charged simply don't support the expatriate model. So are these really branch campuses? 
Um, <clears throat> even within branch campuses, we've seen the growth of concerns about academic standards and about equivalence of learning experiences. So is it even the case that because there is a branch campus with the name of a university above it, what you're going to get there is the same or in any meaningful sense equivalent to what you're going to get at home? And the answer, of course, is it varies. Distance education. Well, um, the notion, the definition of that, of course, is that uh, this is controlled. The curriculum and assessment is typically controlled by the awarding institution, but students study off campus. And, of course, we have a variety of models of that, which are becoming ever more various as technology develops. Um, online synchronous, asynchronous, partial direct support. By that, I mean like the Open University in the UK, where much of the learning is done by uh, online or using prepared materials, but is supplemented by local tutorials, but staffed by people employed, albeit part-time, by the university itself, or the model that the University of London increasingly used, which I call indirect full support. So our students use our materials, but they're taught uh, by third parties in their own institutions, but we keep control of the assessment. I think um, a major advantage of this, and I think this is increasingly being recognized, is that there is no issue really about academic standards here because the awarding body keeps control over it. But of course there are major concerns about the equivalence of the student learning experience. Um, how can the experience of an online learner or a distance learner be considered equivalent with that of an on-campus course? And people increasingly ask, well, does it really matter? Um, I think the other point about distance and online learning is huge variations globally in the acceptability of this. And again, this is a kind of ecological notion that in some territories, uh, distance learning is seen really as the pariah form of learning. It's seen as things that people do if they can't do any other kind of learning. And so as soon as you mention distance learning uh, on your website, there are certain major countries in the world that won't even talk to you um, because they think you are trying to peddle this inferior form of learning in their own country. Finally, to MOOCs. Uh, we've heard a little bit about MOOCs already. Um, you know, are, they, uh, are they transforming the notion of transnational higher education as some people have claimed? Well, just a few, few comments on this. Um, a well-rehearsed uh, uh, comment about MOOCs, of course, is the issue of assessment and certification. Um, how will these courses be assessed? We've seen various different models arriving. But will assessment ever really move beyond some form of you know, electronic multiple choice? We've seen very sophisticated, Donna was talking about much more sophisticated versions of this. Will assessment ever match the kind of assessment that goes on on campus universities? And what will the demand for certification be? We hear about huge numbers, hundreds of thousands of people. My colleagues in the University of London keep telling me that we have some courses going up on Coursera. They haven't even been made yet. And uh, there are something like 200,000 people already registered for them. Does that mean that 200,000 people were going to sign up for these and want some form of serious certification which carries credit? Very much doubt it. We need to think about student demographics as well. One of the facts that um, has emerged is that some 80% of Coursera registrations are by people that have already got a first degree. Well, does this mean that if... Uh, MOOCs do become a major feature of our landscape, does that mean that um, the uh, predominant uh, population of uh, students doing these uh, will be postgraduates? Or does it just mean that um, people with degrees uh, are more likely to be curious about what's going on out there? After all, the commitment to signing up for a free online course is fairly minimal and probably shouldn't be taken as a very reliable indicator of the number of students willing to go through with this in a highly serious way. And I think one of the other points about this is that we've spent the last 15 or 20 years really developing notions of um, student learning and the student learning experience. Huge amounts of debate and discussion have happened around, for example, the notion of student engagement, the notion of active learning, more creative forms of assessment, the Higher Education Funding Council in England has invested millions and millions of pounds in projects to move to more creative ways of learning and assessing students. And nearly all of these 
are social in one form or another. They nearly all involve direct interaction between tutors and students or between students and other students. And it seems to me that with the coming of the MOOC, we're moving in a completely different direction to that. So we almost have two conflicting trends, the on-campus experience moving in one direction, but the off-campus experience moving in another. And finally, and, I, and this is, I think was a point that, uh, that, that Donald made as well, I mean, is are MOOCs really just a case of old wine in new bottles? Um, well, one way of looking at MOOCs is to say they are just one resource in several which make up a, a rich and effective learning experience. It's just something else that the lecturer or the tutor or the teacher can bring in to engage students in, um, in a different way. I was also thinking about this and thinking, actually, does this really differ from what happened uh, in the UK, the Open University, which took its first students in in 1971? I, I can remember as a, as a child these strange television programs that used to come on very late at night when all the other programs ended. These people wearing usually very wide lapel jackets and floral ties and flared trousers would um, come on television and start talking about physics or um, engineering or mathematics. And I knew people whose parents, for example, would set their alarm clocks to get up at five o'clock in the morning and switch the television on. We didn't have daytime television then. And watch the television in the early morning to get the lectures from these programs. These were public. They were free. They were open. And indeed, many people used them. Many people watched them in addition to those people who were actually studying for a course. I can remember when I first started teaching, we had a huge supply of videos of open university broadcasts. And very often when we were stuck for something to cover in a particular class, we'd go to this library, we'd take down a broadcast, and we'd get students to watch it. Is that really uh, all that different from what's going on today in MOOCs? I think the technology is different much more sophisticated, but the principle possibly is the same. And finally, the fact of the matter is, if degrees are going to mean anything at all, awarding bodies have to still take responsibility for the academic standards of what they're doing. They have to be able to say to the world, there is some meaning behind this degree, we are the people who are assuring the standards of that, and so employers, students, whoever our customers are, can be certain that what they're doing is genuinely worthwhile. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Keith, for that very thought-provoking talk. Um, Keith has clearly articul articulated and summarised transnational education and the different forms that it's taken over the years. Um, a reflection for me is the earlier forms were very much dependent upon partnerships, but MOOCs are possibly not, and they're about organisations being able to, if you like, go it alone. Um, I guess the question that I'm thinking of is, are MOOCs a, a, a passing fad, or is there real sustainability there? But, um, but that's, that's my own uh, thought process on this. Are there questions for Keith? Um, and if there are, could you please raise your hand, and somebody will bring a microphone along. Okay, gentleman there. The, the question is concerning um, uh, the, uh, the universities, international universities, um, and uh, the internet, and looking at uh, universities being the incubators of terrorism. How's, how's th that you have this unofficial education? Um, and how is that going to be managed? <clears throat> well, um, I think the an short answer is, can we manage such things anymore? I think the answer is probably not. I mean... In, in that sense, the, um, the, 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 the cat is out of the bag generally. I mean, that's a broader question about the role of technology and the opportunity for minority views to become majority views very, very quickly because like-minded people can find each other around the world, communicate ideas very quickly. Ideas can become normative very quickly because of cyber communities and so on developing. Um, whether this is an issue particularly for universities or whether universities are just one part of that, it is quite difficult to say. But I think you know, one, one of the problems that we have is um, an ethical one about the role of universities in 
attempting or desiring to police that kind of thing, you know, the, the relationship between freedom of speech. And one of the problems with transnational education is that uh, you might be coming from a territory that says freedom of speech is a good thing, people should be able to say more or less what they like, um, but you're operating in a territory which takes an entirely different view about this. And so you have a whole set of issues there about how to design learning materials, how to design assessments such that it is acceptable in both places. Um, I, don't th I, I honestly don't think there's a simple answer to that. I think, I, I think that uh, it is part of a much wider problem about the ways in which people now communicate. And I, you know, censoring the internet clearly doesn't work. Um, I've discovered recently something called proxy servers. Uh, not because I'm trying to do anything disreputable on the internet, but because um, we have a problem of trying to use YouTube for some of our material for students in territories that don't permit the use of YouTube. And so, very simply, for $3 a month, you can set up a proxy server in a country that um, does permit access to it, apparently quite legally, and um, access anything you want. So censoring the internet seems to be a rather sort of modern solution to a postmodern problem. Professor, what I got from your talk is that uh, I think you you are viewing morphs cautiously, mm -hmm. which is a very good thing, because we don't know, like the introducer said, whether it's a passing fare or is it sustainable. Anyway, <clears throat> since you brought up the question of assessment, in the psychometric world today, we are approaching assessment as avenues given to students to demonstrate their abilities to the full. Mm -hmm. And this, because of this, we have uh, conventional assessments and alternative assessments in terms of assignments, projects, etc., trying to get the students more involved in doing. Mm -hmm. And if we are keen on this, this will be very difficult to be replicated in modes yes. because we are not just interested in the assessment of the product. The assessment of the process is as important, and education is about that. Thank you. I, I think that's absolutely right in, in, in the sense that, um, as I said, we, we've spent a lot of time collectively as a community developing new ways of assessing students. We haven't, in fact, done that in the University of London, but that's another matter. Um, but the world of higher education has done this precisely, as you say, to try to better um, determine whether students have met more complex learning outcomes. So for example, if we say that a student by the end of their course should be able to give a presentation, we assess a presentation. And clearly that kind of thing has its limits if you're doing it in that mass way. But a, an alternative model perhaps, uh, and we've seen some of this developing already, would be for the course itself, um, the material to be generally available and individual awarding bodies would construct their own assessments around it. So you would, in fact, I mean, in that sense, a MOOC is nothing other than a book, really. Um, you say to your students, go to the library, read this book, here's my syllabus, read this textbook, and I will decide how to assess your learning in relation to it. You might say, well, just go and sign up for this MOOC, and then I will develop my own assessment around it, and, and the degree or the diploma will be awarded by your own um, awarding body. Keith, you mentioned the Open University mm. because the Open University is really a massive MOOC. Mm. <laughs> it, it has 10 times the number of students at the University of London. Mm -hmm. For the last 10 years, it, uh, on, student, on, the, on the major survey of students, it has beaten the University of London for student satisfaction. I don't really understand this uh, argument that uh, you need this face-to-face -face component. The students love it, a quarter of a million of them. On every score, that giant MOOC presents evidence that this has worked. And remember, these tutors are not doing this face-to-face, -face, they're doing it online. Yeah, I mean, face-to-face I, I, -face is perhaps not the, the right term. There is direct interaction between an individual tutor and the student. And I think the point about the Open University experience is um, that, it, that it is the feedback from the uh, tutor, which has always been a great strength of the 
model. I mean, I, I was a tutor 20 odd years ago on something called D103, which was a social science foundation. In those days, you met your students every week or every fortnight and didn't do it all online. You actually physically met them. But the key thing was the uh, quality of feedback, the quality of interaction wasn't necessarily face to face that took place. And I think one of, the, one of the curious things about the Open University is how difficult it has found it to operate internationally. I mean, the Open University's success is, in, is, is very much a UK-based success, and partly because of its reliance on tutors, and it, this may well change in the future, um, it has been very difficult to really roll out as a, as a, you know, if it had, it would be 10 times the size of the University of London globally, but it isn't because um, of this traditional reliance on uh, anchoring the students to tutors. And um, traditionally, this was a, a, a regional phenomenon. I mean, the OU still has regional offices and staff tutors contracted regionally. So it's very much a geographically bounded tradition. Now, that may be changing, and if that does change, then provided that that, fate, that uh, interaction can still be maintained, then that may well be the, uh, a model for the future. But I don't think that the m concept of the MOOC itself necessarily includes that critical element, which is the interactional element. It's the one part of it. Thank you. Um, I think, just reflecting, MOOCs are passing fad or a sustainable model for the future. What we ought to welcome as, um, as higher education specialists is that this is really causing debate out there that will make us look at pedag pedagogic models that will be fit for the future. So thank you again to Keith for that uh, provoking discussion.